I'd like to start with some good news, if that's all right. Everybody happy with that? Yes. Okay. There are more people die on a Monday morning than any other day of the week. Fact. I was doing a presentation not so long ago, and a cardiologist put his hand up at the back of the room, and he said, Lynn, you're absolutely right. I deal with more fatalities on a Monday than any other day of the week, but why would that be? So I became curious, and I wondered why was that? You know, is work such a bad place to go that you kind of take the ultimate decision and just don't wake up on a Monday morning? Or is there something else at play here? And I decided that I was going to look backwards in time and think about what is it that makes 72% of our workforce, when that alarm clock goes off on a Monday morning, that they say, oh my God, not another week in that place. But would you agree with me that people come to work to do a good job? Yes. Absolutely. There are those people in your organization at that end of the normal distribution of the good, the bad, and the ugly that come to work to do a fantastic job. Am I right? Yeah, they're your stars. You know who those people are. And then there's a majority of people in the middle of that graph that come to work to do a good job. And then there's that lot down that end. The ones who come to work to swing the lead, to pull a fast one, to take advantage. Is there anything else I can say in public? <laughs> but those people are in the minority. But do we set up our leadership practices and cultures to lend to the 97% that come to work to do a good job or the 3% that come to work to screw things up for your organization today? And I got even more curious about this because I thought if the cultures aren't working, I need some inspiration here. And I'm inspired by Steve Jobs. And I know that some of his leadership practices are not that brilliant, but you know what? I'm still inspired. And if you haven't watched the presentation to Harvard graduates on YouTube, that's something for you for homework. But as part of that presentation, he used these words. And he said, you can't join the dots. Look, at, And I thought... Let me look backwards. Let me join a few dots looking backwards over our organization. So I did. And what I found was something just over 20 years ago that emerged in our country. And it's something that you may recognize or not. And it's something that we call the performance culture. And the performance culture looks a little bit like this. If I were to take you as a fly on the wall and put you in a boardroom of a performance culture, you would see a group of men sitting around a table staring at the numbers. Now, I deliberately say men because only 11% of women ever get to the top of those organizations, but that's a different presentation. You'll have to bring me back for that. Okay. But you would see a group of men sitting around the table and they'd be staring at the numbers. And the numbers are targets, revenues, performance, re whatever the numbers are, profits, whatever. Yeah. Now, they didn't set up their businesses to stare at numbers all day. It's just become that way. And every single year, as they go through their business planning cycle, they want more of these results. And so they raise the bar. And they demand increased productivity from their teams. And there's a battle cry that goes with the performance culture, and it is this. We want more for? Less. More for less. And less usually means less cost. Am I right? Yeah. Absolutely. But whatever you do, do not compromise on the quality of service that we deliver to our customers, <laughs> because we've got to deliver that absolutely, and we deliver that, by the way, through headcount. And people are often referred to in these organizations as headcount, because they're the opportunity for cost reduction. And so over the years, we have seen layers and layers and layers and layers of people stripped out of these businesses. And in one organization I was in not so long ago, they didn't even call their people headcount. They called them WCRTs, Walking Cost Reduction Targets. <sighs> no wonder people die on a Monday. But what's the impact of the performance culture on business? Well, when you as a leader focus just on the targets, the numbers, the costs, and the business results, it has both an internal and an external impact on your business. 
Now, what these smart accountants and financial people did, and no disrespect to anybody who is in that function right now, what they did was they stripped out layers and layers and layers of headcount, but what they forgot to do was strip out layers and layers and layers of work. So the survivors, and by Jove, they were even called survivors. <laughs> yeah. They were left to do the job of two, three, four, sometimes five people. We put one young man, business partner Ali Dawson's at the front here with me today, we put one young man on sabbatical 18 months ago from a financial institution, but not RBS, okay? <laughs> this young man had worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week, for three years without a break. Now, I call that addiction to work, yeah? But you know what? It's the only goddamned addiction that our country rewards. We don't reward drug abuse, alcohol abuse, sexual abuse, but by God, if he puts in the hours, let's give him a bigger office and a fatter paycheck to go with it. It's old-fashioned management, and it is so out of date. Don't manage people based on their input, i.e. their hours. Manage them on their contribution, their output. But what we've seen in the UK is the rise of the long hours culture. We work 46% longer hours in the UK than any other European Union neighbour, and we're 27% less productive because of it. So if you want increased productivity, long hours is not what you do. We used to be called the naked ape. Nowadays, we're just the knackered ape. <laughs> we have just become so exhausted. It is all we can do to keep our head above the workload level. We run from meeting to meeting, email to email, target to target, and we are absolutely knackered because of it. And the long hours culture is having a big impact on our well-being. I get to work with the Sunday Times top 100 best companies to work for, and this is the data that shows. On the y-axis, your levels of well-being. On the x-axis, your hours of work. It does not take a rocket scientist to see. The longer you work, the iller you become. The British Medical Association and UCL have re released a report this year to show that you're 67% more likely to get heart disease or digestive cancer <laughs> because of the long hours cult. By the way, I'm not a motivational speaker, okay? <laughs> I'm going to depress the living daylights out of all of you and then I'm going to pick you back up in, in just a minute with the good news, the, the trends that are coming. But the fact is, it's just not working. What happens is sickness absence goes up. 80% of all sickness absence is due to work, is due to stress. And 46% of that is due to work and life imbalance. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you in this room are, have got children? Just a quick show of hands. Those that you know about, at least, yeah? <laughs> Do you know in the UK right now, over 41% of parents spend less than an hour a day with their little ones? What kind of society are we developing if our children and families and those who we love are less important than our emails and our targets? So sickness absence goes up, attrition's gone up. 68% of new businesses in the UK last year were set up by women who said, I've had enough. I cannot deal with this any longer. More about that in just a minute. So there you go, your costs have gone up. So all this bright ideas about strapping everybody to their desks, increasing their productivity by giving them more to do, actually is increasing your costs, not reducing them. So you have two choices here. You could go around another round of downsizing. But if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Yeah? Or you can hike your prices up to your customer. But your customer is already dogged off. You know, when they phone in, they, you know, you're so tired, you can't be bothered speaking to them anyway. You're so exhausted. One guy in an engineering company that we work in said to me a few weeks ago, Lynn, if customers would only stop bugging us, we'd get our day job done. Yeah? <laughs> but the outcome is clear. Customers want bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, innovative, creative organizations that they can work with. It doesn't work. The performance culture is out of date, RIP. And it particularly impacts women in the workplace. 70% of working, working age women work outside the home. One in six of you have children under the age of 16. I don't know if you're, you've noticed this, but little ones can't get themselves up in the morning. 
get themselves dressed, breakfasted, off to nursery school or school, get themselves home in the evening, make their own supper, give themselves a bath, get a bedtime story and get themselves off to bed. And yet we expect our parents to be chained to the desk at seven in the morning and not leave till 10 at night. We expect our families to look after themselves. But here's what gets us as women. If a woman's average age of having her first child is 30 years old, 86% of caring responsibilities in a family are still down to women. 22% of your workforce have elder care as well as childcare responsibility. And let's be honest, our parents are living longer. So you think you look after your kids for 18 years? Right now it's 22 years and rising for looking after mum and dad or any other dependent. My husband said, Lynn, you're absolutely right. You've got three time, full-time jobs. You've got to work for the business. You've got to, you know, I want you 100%. The kids want you 100%. The boss wants you 100%. Where in goodness name is time for self and all of that? I calculated as part of my lipstick leadership research that women on average get 14.8 hours a year to themselves. And we feel guilty about that too. <laughs> but my husband said to me, Lynn, you're absolutely right. He said, this is unbelievable. No wonder you're exhausted. All I need to do in the morning is shower, shave and shove off. <laughs> Am I right? For you, it's a feat of military precision just to get out the door in the morning. In the next 10 years after a woman has had her first child, only 4% of women are ever promoted. What is that about? What is that about in our country? Women can't work part-time and be a manager? Rubbish. Total rubbish. But women aren't getting promoted. Now, I know that some of these women are saying, you know what, I've got enough going on with the shower and shave and shove off bloke and the kids. I don't need the promotion as well. Thank you very much especially if it's a performance culture. Women are four times more likely to get stress-related illness. No wonder, for God's sake, 50 hours a week working, 50 hours a week working at home. You know, no wonder. We're human doings, not human beings, us women. But here's what gets us, ladies. I did a piece of uh, research with a colleague of mine who's dean of the business school in Boston. And he did a piece, of a piece of research over in the States, and I replicated it over here. 76% of women who reach the top of organisations have a life partner, either same sex or opposite sex, who has an equally professional job. So if she's a dentist, he's a lawyer, it's that sort of thing. However, 76% of men who reach the top have a wife who stays at home. There is no empathy up there. And so therefore, we have to change the way work works for good. It is no longer appropriate to run our organizations the way we're doing it. And so that really inspired Ali and I to, to launch a piece of research about three years ago. By the way, this is the end of the depression, OK? I'll pick you up now. We launched a piece of research called Living Leadership to look at what is the workplace of the future. And then we realized, and I loved Bruno Brooks's statement when he says, the future holds no frequency. It's about the now. And what we very quickly realized was that it's now that we need new leadership practices. Now, as we're coming out of a recession, now as we're developing new organizations with new people coming into them, that we need something different. You all know the world is a small place now. My daughter has just come back from a gap year in Australia. It only took her 24 hours to get there. When my aunt emigrated to Australia when I was a little girl. It took her six weeks to get there, and it was a one-way trip. Our world is much smaller, so we can get around it. That means that we're much more switched on. But the trouble with being always on is that you don't get any downtime either. It's a kind of 24-7 culture as well. Attached to the crackberry, is that what they call it? <laughs> yeah. But virtually, we're much more switched on, and the world is much flatter as well. And that means that in future, your employability and the employability of your teams is going to be not based on your geography, but it's going to be based on your values. And you know this absolutely because you've spoken about it already today. Work is not a place you go, it's a thing you do. And so the world of work has to change to match those two things. Ali and I work in the Google organization a lot. And in Google, what they say to us, Lynn, we hire for attitude. We can train the rest. Yeah. We don't want somebody hiring somebody for their competencies. 
We want to hire somebody for their attitude. Am I right in thinking that if you get somebody with a bad attitude, they're a punishment from God? Yeah? It doesn't matter how good their CV is. They're not so good once you've got them in there for a very long time. So attitude and values really, really important. And so we know this culture doesn't work. We know that the performance culture, when you stare at the numbers all day in an attempt to increase productivity and reduce cost, no disrespect to British Airways, by the way, I, I heard your strategy, doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what does work? What, by the way, I am a very loyal customer of British Airways. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. Everywhere I fly... Is that silver or gold card? I, it's silver, but I, would, I like... I that's all right, then. I'm very loyal. Soon. Yes. Yeah. Do you notice we tap dancing there? I got back on track there. No, seriously. We know that it has to change. But interestingly, when we did the research, we also noticed that those four things were still visible. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. But wouldn't they be on any business balance scorecard? Wouldn't you be measuring those anyway? Of course you would. It's the point of entry. It's the area of focus that has changed. And what we've discovered was that the focus, and I'm going to go into that area of excellence in a bit more detail in just a moment, just to give you the background that sits in behind that. But what we noticed was when these companies use the living leadership approaches and, and they're doing the things that we discovered, what we found was that these are organizations really truly understand what is their destiny. Now, I bet loads of you have got visions in your organization. Well, our corporate vision is, yeah? And it's all very good, but nobody ever bounced out of bed in the morning for a vision. I, honestly, they don't. People will work for you for a vision, they'll die for a cause, but they'll aim for a destiny. And you can pull people behind you with a destiny. And it's, it, you might just think I'm you know, talking words here. Obviously, I am. <laughs> but it's very different. A destiny is, is a very different place. And what they say is a little bit what British Airways talked about with the Jim Collins idea, which is, you know, if we've got the right people on the bus in the right seats, we can take that bus anywhere that destiny is. We can take it wherever we want to go. But if you've got people in that organisation with the right attitude, and also, as an HR person, you have ripped up every competency framework in your business because it's out of date and focused on performance cultures, then you've got a chance of making this work a little bit more. Because what these people do is they say, we are going to play to people's strengths. We are not going to have job roles. We're going to have strengths-based leadership. Because if we have people who do what they love and love what they do, do they do it well? Absolutely. People who love what they do and do it well. I mean, Chris Evans is fantastic. You wouldn't put him behind the scenes, would you, in radio? He's brilliant at what he does. People who play to their strengths absolutely do a fantastic job. You get quality. Those people love their customers. They're passionate about their career. They're passionate about what they do. And if you get quality, by the way, productivity goes up 31%. Write that one down, 31%. There is no rework in that system. People who love what they do and do what they love do it right the first time. And they do it efficiently, effectively, and they're more innovative around that service. Costs come down. And if costs come down and productivity goes up and customer loyalty goes up, guess what? Business results happen. We've been walking backwards for the last 20 years, and it's time to turn around. But... Is it just about dancing backwards in high heels? I don't think so. I think there's something else at, at play here. And this is where we really began to look inside a business, and we've done this research across many organizations to find out what is it that's coming? What is the living leadership approach? 